this is Roof of the Clan of the Grey Wolf, and welcome back to 8-Bit Gems. I'd like to take the opportunity this April 1st to remind you what this show is all about. To highlight the unappreciated games of yesteryear. To give a fair shake to the unjustly maligned. And with all that in mind, I'd like to talk about... <clears throat> today... about... <clears throat> back to the Future! Hold on! Hold on right there. Give me just one minute to uh, explain myself a little bit, please. I realize this game has all the cards stacked against it. A movie-based game from the NES era, and an LJN game at that. Back to the Future was an early target of some of the biggest names in Angry Reviewing. It's so bad that Bob Gale, the co-writer and co-producer of the movie, said that the NES game in particular was, quote, one of the worst games ever citing how LJN took no creative input from anyone involved with the movie. He even explicitly told fans to not buy the game. That's pretty damning. Although, apparently not damning enough to prevent an LJN product placement in Back to the Future Part 2. Now, look, I'm not saying this is a great game, just that the hate's been heaped a bit too high, and that there's a gem here somewhere in the rough. The rough, roughy roughness of Ruffertonville, PA, home of McRuff the Crime Dog. King of the Andals in the first- Let's step back a minute and cast a critical glance at LJN, the much maligned distributor of several subpar movie licensed games in the 80s. Jaws, A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Karate Kid. How did this no-name video game company get the rights to such blockbuster movies in the first place? Well, it may surprise you to find out that they began as a simple toy company that just happened to be owned by MCA, which is a name that should be at least somewhat familiar to consumers of popular culture before the turn of the century. MCA was a huge media conglomerate that produced and distributed music, television, and films, and as you can imagine, they had a sizable portfolio of distribution rights to play with, including movies made by subsidiary Universal Pictures, which created... Dun dun dun! Jaws. Wait, what are we talking about? Oh yeah, and Back to the Future. In 1985, RCA bought LJN with an eye on leveraging their lucrative movie rights by creating toys and games directly, rather than licensing them out. Unfortunately, if you're a stockholder, or fortunately, if you're anyone else, after several years running at a loss, LJN was sold to Acclaim in 1990, where it was completely absorbed by 1995. RCA officially changed its name to Universal Studios the following year, and the names of both LJN and RCA have since passed into... the past. So, that explains why LJN had the rights to all these movie-based video games, but why was their track record of quality so spotty? I mean, there were clear stinkers like The Uncanny X-Men, but also generally solid titles like Maximum Carnage. The not-so-terrible secret is that LJN, as a company, never made a video game. Instead, all LJN published games were outsourced to external developers. In the case of Back to the Future, the creator was Beam Software, an Australian developer which also created some true hidden gems in Nightshade for the NES and Shadowrun for the Super Nintendo. So even if you're not a fan of Back to the Future as a game, it's misguided to cast it off as another LJN crap fest. They had little to do with the game's actual development. But that's just some history. Let's take a look at the game itself. The first thing people like to complain about with Back to the Future is that it bears strikingly little resemblance to the movie. You have Marty running down an increasingly frustrating series of streets, hurling bowling balls at bees and collecting clocks, all while an insufferable song that doesn't sound like anything plays on loop every 49 seconds. One might say, certainly this nonsense has nothing to do with the movie. Well, you'd be surprised at how many similarities there actually are. And don't call me certainly. Let's tackle the most glaring issue first the infamous music. The one track seemingly out of nowhere that plays for approximately 95.3% of the game on repeat. Would you believe that it's actually supposed to be The Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the News? No, really. It took me 25 years to find that out myself. Just slow it down from its jacked up 150 beats per minute to about 120 and compare. Makes sense. Kinda. There's still a mystery here. Why was it sped up so much? Why no melody? 
Why are this and About a Minute of Johnny B. Good literally the only tracks in the game? Beam Software's composer, an Australian musician named Gavin Anderson, worked on a handful of other NES games that also used established songs, such as the William Tell Overture. And Listen to the Mockingbird, otherwise known as the Three Stooges theme. He had no problem making these tracks recognizable in 8-bit form. So what's the problem here? My hypothesis is that it might have something to do with the fact that these songs are from the 19th century, and thus in the public domain. Gavin Anderson has said previously that the tempo of the tracks in Back to the Future were set by the game's programmer, Greg Barnett. So my best guess is that LJN had some problem with securing the song rights in addition to those of the movie. So a close enough method might have been the best option. In the meantime, I'll admit the soundtrack can be pretty grating. My advice is to hit the mute button and play the movie's actual soundtrack. It makes the game sufficiently epic. Hell, there's tons of 8 and 16-bit renditions of Alan Silvestri's famous score on YouTube. Just play that on loop and you'll find a markedly improved experience. Moving on to problems people have with the gameplay. Obviously, this all takes place in 1955 Suburban Hill Valley. The game must take some liberties with obstacles in order to make things interesting, and it's not like window movers, hula hoop girls, or trash cans are out of place in this setting. There are even Biff-esque bullies chasing you down, and logically, they're the only enemies who chase you. Well, except for the bees, but that's because bees are dicks. Anyway, it's not like Bean Software just randomly dropped knights on horseback or giant turtles into the game. In the context of the setting, the enemies make sense. People rightly criticize that Marty wears a black tank top instead of his trademark red life preserver, but there's likely a reason for the design choice here. At the very least, the contrasting colors of the arms show 8-bit movement better than they would otherwise. Mario was given a mustache back in Donkey Kong for similar reasons. I've also read theories that the black shirt is due to the wardrobe of the first actor to play Marty, Eric Stoltz. After all, he did record weeks worth of scenes before being replaced by Michael J. Fox. But I am less inclined to bite on this rumor, since the movie had already been out for several years before development began on the game, and it wasn't exactly common knowledge that Stoltz was the original Marty until the age of DVD extras and the internet, so his shirt is black. Deal with it. The need to collect clocks is just a somewhat literal interpretation of how Marty needs time to finish his main goals before his whole family is erased from existence, as shown by the photo of Marty and his siblings at the bottom of the screen, taken directly from the movie. Although granted, it looks more like a photo of George Washington, Dick Clark, and Billy Idol, but it's 8-bit. What are you going to do? The clock collecting mechanic adds a dimension to the game to make it more fun. You can't argue that it would be a better game without it, since it would just make it more boring. To me, it seems that a lot of the consternation people have with the game is summed up in how it's played. Instead of a platformer, as most might expect in the late 80s, we have an overhead, constantly scrolling, clock collecting game. Unhappiness with the unexpected gameplay causes a tendency to nitpick, but once you open your eyes to what the programmers were trying to make, it's easier to accept the vision. What we have here is a type of shoot-'em-up. Specifically, a vertical scrolling shooter. You just don't always have a weapon available, is all. After avoiding a collision for a period of time, a bowling ball appears for you to use as a weapon. Last a bit longer, and a skateboard, from the movie, pops up, giving you a speed boost. At its core, Back to the Future is not far removed from Spy Hunter, oil spills and all. Or, if you will, Paperboy. Understanding is the first step to acceptance. But there's more to the game than just these street levels. They lead to the four goals Marty needs to meet to get Back to the Future. You'll come across each unique special stage after making it through four of the aforementioned street levels. First, protect Marty's dad from the bullies. This stage is not dissimilar to Tapper, where you need to fell 50 of Biff's goons with milkshakes before moving on. It's difficult at first, but like any good game, practice makes perfect. Gather some experience, spray and pray the airspace with multi-goodness, and you'll rarely lose. Plus, when all else fails, you do have a super shake or two to clear the whole screen. Next, rebuff Lorraine's advances. 
This is like a reverse of the previous stage, where you need to block kisses with a book, but it's different enough to still be engaging, since instead of the discrete projectiles to block, it's a steady stream of incesty goodness. The next stage involves getting Marty's parents to fall in love at the Fish Under the Sea dance. Their first date. This is my favorite part of the game. First off, the stage is really fun. You have to catch the music being thrown at you by the band to play it correctly. Regular notes fly in at the middle, sharps up high, and flats down low. Clever. All while a passable version of Johnny Be Good plays in the background. Sure, there are some liberties with the conversion to 8-bit, and it's still sped up to an ungodly tempo, but at least it's recognizable. Plus, it's the only time the game's main theme is not playing, which is like a soothing balm on the ears. And besides, Marty having to make all those gyrations to catch notes actually mimics Marty playing Johnny B. Good pretty well from the movie. Bonus! In the final level, Marty needs to catch the lightning bolt at the clock tower. Finally, the DeLorean makes an appearance. You simply need to avoid stray lightning bolts while ensuring you hit the clock tower at 88 miles per hour to catch the bolt that matters. Honestly, the least exciting gameplay you're going to come across in this title, but it's the climax of the film! The game gets bonus points for simply evoking this scene. Like in the movie, you only have one chance to make it back to the future. Fail, and it's game over. Win, and it's still game over, but at least you get happier block text as a reward? Eh, okay, the ending sucks regardless, but that was the style of video game finales at the time. It's unfair to single out this game's ending for being particularly bad. In the end, Back to the Future won't win any best of awards, but it's far from the worst game on the NES. The gameplay is not obtuse. There's actually a tight control scheme, good hit detection, and lots of freedom of movement for a vertical scroller. And the difficulty is challenging without being unfair. As with a lot of these retro games, you just need to put in the time to get better. It personally takes me less than 25 minutes to beat, and I'm far from the wizard here. At its core, Back to the Future doesn't aspire to a lot, but I do find it genuinely enjoyable. And I think a lot of other people would too if they just gave it a fair shake. Look past the rainbow. Just because it says LJN doesn't mean it's terrible. Except Back to the Future 2 and 3. That game is absolute balls. Thanks for watching, and there is no reset button.